when the Holy Spirit tells you because here we don't tie people's hands for time. Because right there is what time it is. If you'll look, can you right there, there's what time it is. No. Up on the TV, that's what time it is. If you'll look, if you can. That's right. It's preaching time. Amen. Oh, we're live? All right. Welcome and uh, appreciate y'all being here on a Friday evening. Friday evening. Thank y'all very much for coming. If you're uh, online watching, thank you very much for being with us online as well. Um, I'll tell you what, we'll start off tonight with a song. Uh, grab your hymnals. Well, I should say grab a hymnal. I don't know if you, these are personal hymnals in here. Um, but um, hit, turn to hymn number 394, The Solid Rock. The Solid Rock. And we'll do all four stanzas. Amen. Let's sing the best we can. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the Son, <coughs> rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. On a third, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Here we go on the last. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I like that second stanza. I like all of it, but that second stanza. Look, circumstances come our way. We cannot control uh, outside circumstances. Storms do come. And when the wind starts blowing, with winds of trouble in your life, starts blowing bless god according to that uh, number two stanza when all around my soul gives way he it's he then is all my stay put your trust in jesus amen no other person it's good to have y'all danny how about leading us in a word of prayer if you would Amen. Y'all go ahead and be seated. 
And I do want to thank you. It's good to have Bethany's mom all the way across the York, or the, uh, what's the name of that bridge down yonder? The Coleman Bridge. Man, we're talking bridges, so we got to specify sometimes. Uh, but it's good to have you with us tonight. I know your daughter's not here, but you're here, and thank you very much for that. Amen. Um, just real quick, tonight, obviously 7 o'clock, Dr. Yoho is going to be here, and uh, he's here. And uh, what we'll do is after tonight, yes, sir? I'm here, but that doesn't mean I'm all there. I will agree with that. I definitely will agree with that. Let me first off apologize for the attire that I am wearing. Uh, today was a very long day, uh, so I, I know I don't have a tie on, and uh, y'all please forgive me. Well, thank you, my beautiful wife. That's my beautiful wife. But um, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, all right, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, we'll pick it back up because I don't think he'll finish tonight. But tomorrow morning at 10, please be here. After the first session, we'll have a lunch, and then we'll do another session. And then uh, don't forget, Sunday morning during the evening service that we have in the mornings is going to be question and answer period. So if you've got a question, uh, start thinking of one. If you don't have one yet, if you know something about uh, the great white throne judgment, something about the, and I'm pretty sure he's going to go over this, the marriage supper of the lamb. When is that going to take place? You know, I, you know, a lot of things that you might have a question. And don't think your question is a silly or a dumb question, okay? Don't think that. If you've got a question about just eschatology, Sunday morning will be your opportunity to ask that question. Um, and I think I want to give him as much. This is for you, brother. So wet your whistle. Take you a little bit longer tonight. Amen. Um, I would like to ask that, and I'm, I'm guilty too. Let's take these things right here and let's turn them down. Turn them off if you can. Adam, I throw them. I, some people might need them, and I totally understand that. But please, please just. Put them on, respect the house of God and, and his word. Amen. Like I said Wednesday night, there's nothing in this world more important than the word of God. Amen. Nothing should interrupt the, the, the word of God. Um, so uh, let me ask you all to do that. And I can't think of anything else I can introduce now, Dr. Yoho. He, uh, I was actually running through my head how I could introduce you. You know, he's a doctor at Tabernacle Baptist Bible College and uh, a professor there and he still teaches. He, he's got a book ministry, uh, Missions 300, uh, and uh, so he spends a lot of time writing, I'm sure. And, uh, but I, what I want to do is I'm going to pray, and after I get done praying, Dr. Yoho, you come on up. But uh, just right now, if y'all would, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to bless this meeting. Father, Lord, we love you. And Father, we first and foremost, Lord, we just want to give you glory. We want to give you praise. Because, Father, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, your word does declare that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. And, Father, I want to thank you for those that have already bowed their knee and with their tongue hath already confessed you as Lord. Father, I want to thank you for Dr. Yoho. Lord, I know he's got things going on at his house and uh, Lord, his ministry, but he has taken time out of his schedule to be here in Gloucester and to minister to us here at New Hope Baptist Church. Lord, I want to thank you how you have used him, uh, not only in the ministry, but in, the, in my life and uh, in my family's life, dear Father. Lord, I pray now that as he comes and, and uh, Father starts off this Bible conference, that you would clear his head, clear his mind of anything that would distract from teaching us your word. And Father, that you would speak to us through him words that we need to hear. And we'll give you the glory for what you'll do. And Father, I do pray that if there is one in our midst, maybe somebody watching online that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray before it's eternally too late that they'll come down to an altar of repentance and they'll accept the blood that Jesus shed at Calvary. For it's in his name that we ask it all, and amen. So, Dr. Yoho, you come, and as the Lord leads, you do. Thank amen. You. you need some help? Um, you want 
talk for more. I uh, just need a little bit of time. <laughs> hey, that's all right. You're not a spring chicken anymore, are you? No, sir. Like you was last year, anyway. No, sir. I was just talking to Jay tonight. He's still young compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> so only by one year. Only by one uh, year. <laughs> amen, brother. Uh, thank you so much, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank you. God bless you. You want a stool? I may, I may need one later, not right oh, now, but uh, yeah. sometimes that, that helps if, uh, if it's a longer time. Yeah, thank you. Well, I feel blessed for a lot of reasons. One important reason I feel blessed is the uh, friendship of uh, Pastor and his family. And another reason I feel blessed, and it's very related, is the uh, fellowship with uh, New Hope Independent Baptist Church. Uh, uh, your pastor and his family and this church mean a great deal to me. And uh, so thankful we can be together again in this conference. I uh, am truly thankful. Um, I received a wonderful, encouraging letter from Becky. And um, Pastor had mentioned this to me earlier, though, but uh, having the uh, church take on our writing ministry as a missionary ministry um, just meant so much to me. and was such an encouragement. And um, so I, I just truly want to thank you for that. And I wanted to say a little word about the books before we got into the prophecy. Um, as a way of saying thank you to the church for taking on Mission Street 100 as a missionary ministry, um, and I'm so grateful. We have been doing this for about 45 years, and in the last 35 or 40 years of those 45, it's been a nonprofit missionary ministry. And um, it's so encouraging when a church comes alongside of us to, to help us with that. And so uh, we're very grateful. Um, as a way of saying thank you, I wanted to make available as gifts to the church uh, two books that we recently got off the press since I had received word from Pastor and Becky that the church was taking us on. We had such a great response to the books even last year, I was very grateful. Um, and uh, we have um, mentioned Pastor Seabolt um, and uh, the church in uh, the newest book that we just got off the press about two days ago. We have found him, and uh, it's a study of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, I had been working on an apostolic masterpiece for about two years. It's a study of the book of Romans that came off the press about a month ago, month and a half ago, and these books are new to the church family, but uh, as a way of saying thank you to the church family for taking Mission Street 100 on, which means so much to me, uh, on the front pew down there, I've got copies of each of these books. Uh, I don't have any on the back table back there. I have them here on the front pew, and the reason for that is these are gifts to every family in the church who would like to have one. Um, I think I brought enough. I brought, I think, 20 of each. Uh, but uh, they're for every family in the church. So these, just please go and take one. Um, and if you're a visitor or something tonight, please take one also. Um, but these are there for you. It's a way of saying thank you for helping us. And with each new book that we get off the press, uh, I'd like to uh, make them available to the church family as a gift, as a way of saying thank you. Uh, one book that I think may be new uh, since the last time we were here, came off the press maybe about nine, ten months ago, is called The Semester in a Sermon. Dean was asking which books might be new. I think this book uh, is new to the church family. Um, I think you'll find it interesting. What I did is I tried to take what you might teach in a college semester, and I tried to put it in a sermon, a short sermon. Uh, I remember years ago in Greensboro, I 
at Crusade Baptist Church, I try to go through the entire New Testament in one sermon. We call that a semester in a sermon. Sometimes we try to do a whole college course in a Bible conference. We call that a course at a conference. Um, but I, I tried to take a number of interesting subjects, like uh, a journey through John, a scenic view of the Old Testament, a scenic view of the New Testament, um, uh, the problem of evil. Um, uh, Jesus answers Job, how Jesus gives the answers to the ultimate questions of life. And just any, any number of topics, um, uh, uh, a study of God's uh, 17 works of God, wonders without number. Uh, but I just tried to take a number of topics that could be taught in a college class, tried to put them in maybe a one, four, or five page sermon, and tried to hit the highlights and just try to put a lot of information at your fingertips. So we call this a semester in a sermon. And we just tried to put a lot of information right at your fingertips, hoping it could be useful. So this is one of the newer books back there. One book that you're very familiar with, but uh, we just did a reprint on rather recently. And uh, I know there's some new families in the church. And this book is called Tremendous Truths About Trials. Uh, we can all identify with this. There was a church in Denver years ago that had a sign out front that said, if you have problems, come in and tell us about them. If you don't have any, come in any way and tell us how you do it. <laughs> uh, we, we, all, we all have trials. Uh, forgive me for saying this, Pastor and Connie, but um, as I know of your vocational background, but um, it has been said that the um, guy whose problems are all behind him it's probably a school bus driver. <laughs> we all got problems. <laughs> and uh, this book goes into 49 principles from the Word of God and Christian experience to try to help you and me react right when things go wrong in our lives through the power of Christ and uh, through the wisdom of the Spirit. So uh, we have uh, back there probably about roughly 65 books on different subjects, um, and just love to have you look through them. We, we have the plan of salvation on the back under good news, and we just make them available to you on a donation basis. The, these here are gifts, and the books back there are available on a donation basis. Uh, donation basis means three things in our ministry. It means, first of all, there's no set charge for the books. Uh, secondly, it means a donation is not required if you want to get the book, we want you to get it. Uh, Lord has a way if we get the books out, he sends the money in for the printing uh, and the postage. Uh, but if you are in a position to leave a donation of whatever amount, uh, we'd be grateful and we'll put that right back into the ministry and uh, try to keep the ministry going. We try to use that to get books to the mission field and into different stores and things like that. So uh, we'd be very grateful for that help. I do have a box here I just wanted to say something about. I'll try not to say too much about it during the conference. Um, uh, but sometimes people are interested in getting a whole set of books. And um, we've got right now, by God's grace, about 76 books that we're trying to keep in print. And, um, and uh, so I put a box together of all the books we have in print. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have the two new books there, but but they'll be available to you anyway. But it's a, it's a complete set, and those we make available for a suggested donation, and I just like to be upfront with the church about that. Um, we're making the entire set in that box, you can just conveniently carry it home, uh, available for a suggested donation of $149. And that would help our ministry, but we try to make it a, a good price. Um, the books would retail at a Christian bookstore at about $550 to $600. Our printing costs and postage costs on those books are about $300. So you say, how does that help you if we give you a donation of $149? It helps us. First of all, we like getting the books out. But secondly, it helps us because a lot of the money for the books that we print come in through donations and love gifts. And so if we just get that much back, it helps us and uh, we can get the books out. 
So it actually does help us when you get the books at that, but I, I want you to know that it costs us about $300 to, to print those. Uh, but if we can get 149 back with the love gifts coming in, that still helps us, and hopefully uh, you can get them for an extra low price if, if you're interested in getting them. And people get them for different reasons. Some people might have a lot of books, but say, I want to get the ones I don't have, and then maybe give the ones I do have to somebody else. Somebody may want to make a purchase for a church library. Somebody might uh, know a, a, a person who's heading to the mission field and want to make a gift uh, available to the missionary for his study or for a Bible institute he might be starting. So there are different things that one can do with the books. Uh, one could purchase the books for the church, and then when God leads the church, give them to a missionary going to the field who comes through the church. But it uh, uh, takes me a while to get the 75 books or so together. So uh, I only have one box of them there. Doesn't mean that if there's some interest, we can't put another box together and get them to the pastor somehow. But we do have that box there. And uh, I was kind of hoping somebody would want to get the whole set. So that's why we got those there. Um, but it's uh, so good to be with you. and. Um, it's a great crowd for Friday night. Um, just very grateful you'll be here. Pastor had asked me to uh, bring something in the field of prophecy. And several years ago, we did talk about Bible prophecy at uh, New Hope. I thought we'd maybe take it in a little different direction. I have been doing a lot of study in the last few years in the book of Revelation. In fact, when I was serving Filipino Independent Baptist Church in Norfolk as interim pastor, uh, we went through the book of Revelation over 10 months on Sunday morning. And we eventually put that series of sermons in book form called uh, in an aisle that is called Patmos. We shared those books last year and it's in two volumes and we've got those books back there too. But I've been doing a lot of work in the book of Revelation in the last few years. So I thought I would deal with Bible prophecy tonight by covering Revelation 19 through 21.8, which is right at the kind of the height of the book of Revelation, dealing with uh, the Hallelujah Chorus, the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, the Visible Return of Christ, the Millennium, Amen. the Great White Throne Judgment, and uh, the New Heavens and Earth. I have a lot of material on heaven that we won't have a chance to cover tonight, but I, I do hope to cover the new heavens and earth in Revelation 21, 1 through 8, and say a little bit about the new Jerusalem, uh, which is in Revelation 21, 9 through 22, 5. And uh, we have some uh, printed notes that we hope would help you follow along, and Steve passed those out. Does anybody need a set of notes? I think we brought enough so that everybody could have a set. And if you could bring these back with you uh, in the other sessions, uh, we hope to go through these uh, between now and Sunday morning. I'm hoping on Sunday morning at 8.30 to have a question and answer session. I'm hoping at the Sunday school to preach on the Great White Throne Judgment. And I'm hoping in the morning worship service to preach on Christ's visible return back to earth on a white horse. And the other material, I'd like to kind of work around um, that in uh, the Friday and Saturday sessions. So we are on, and forgive me, I've taken these notes from a larger set of Revelation notes, and so that's why we start with page 19. Um, but on your notes, it's page 19, the first page, and it's Revelation chapter 19. And Revelation 19 is a fascinating chapter the chapter has two brides and two banquets. Two brides and two banquets. I'm using the word bride, though, in kind of a loose sense. In the beginning of the chapter, all of heaven praises God for the destruction of the great whore, the false religious organization that would dominate world history in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. And uh, the great whore is uh, the bride of Antichrist. So she is a bride, but not a good kind of bride. Um, uh, but you have the fall of the great whore celebrated in the beginning of the chapter. So that's one bride. And then a little later, you have the marriage supper of the lamb. 
uh, Christ's uh, marriage to his bride, the church. So you've got two brides, and then you've got two banquets. You've got the marriage supper of the lamb earlier in the chapter. Blessed is he that is invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. But then you've got the supper of the great God at the end of the chapter. Now the marriage supper of the lamb is glad and glorious. But the supper of the great God, as we shall see, is grisly and gruesome as all the fowls of heaven pick the bones of Antichrist army clean at the second coming of Christ. In, these chap in this chapter, we have a wedding and a war. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb earlier in the chapter, and then we have Armageddon in the second half of the chapter. We have also a white horse and a wine press. Christ leads heaven's army back into Armageddon to defend Israel against all the armies of the earth. And he leads heaven's army on a white horse. But then the earth is ripe for judgment and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God at Armageddon. So we have a winepress. We have horses from heaven. Heaven opens and heaven's army descends. We have horses from heaven but we also have vultures over Armageddon. We have celebration and coronation. Amen. In chapter 19, we celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. His wife hath made herself ready. But we also have coronation. Christ comes back wearing many crowns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it's a very interesting chapter. And the chapter may be divided in terms of announcements, Advent, and Armageddon. Announcements, Advent, and Armageddon. Now, we use the word Advent a lot, but I'm not sure everybody knows where it comes from. And for you English teachers, I am sorry. I know that a preposition is something you should never end a sentence with. <coughs> But um, some of you may not know where Armageddon, where Advent comes from, or from where Advent comes. <laughs> but Advent comes into the English from the Latin, and it's just another word for coming. So we speak of Christ's first Advent. That's another way of saying his first coming. We speak of Christ's second advent. That's just another way of saying Christ's second coming. You say, well, why don't you use coming instead of advent? Because I'm trying to line up my alliteration with three A's, and A fits my, ad my alliteration better than coming in this case. Um, so we have announcements, great announcements from heaven, and we have advent, Christ's second coming, and then we have Armageddon, the great World War III of history. We start off with two great announcements in Revelation 19, 1 through 10. The first great announcement involves, among other things, the judgment of the great whore, Babylon. The judgment of the great whore, Revelation 19, 1 through 6. We have the fall of religious Babylon in chapter 17. We have the fall of commercial political Babylon in chapter 18. And now in heaven's fourfold alleluia chorus, we have all of heaven celebrating the downfall of Babylon. So we have the judgment of the great whore in Revelation 19, 1 through 6. And I'd be obliged if somebody could read that for the church out loud. Revelation 19, 1 through 6. Bill, thank you.
Thanks, Bill. Sinners cry, alas, but saints shout hallelujah at the fall of the godless world system called Babylon. Amen. Saints cry, alas, in Revelation 18, 9 through 19, as Babylon falls in one hour under the mighty stroke of God's judgment, for strong is the Lord God that judgeth her. Sinners cry alas when Babylon falls, but the saints shout hallelujah. The difference in perspective is striking. The thought of the destruction of the wicked out of the earth evokes a hallelujah from one who is in accord with the mind and purposes of God. You see, God's people rejoice with him in the salvation of sinners. But even so, in the coming day of judgment, they will rejoice with him in the judgment of the wicked. They will say, hallelujah. Upon whom did not Nineveh's wickedness pass continually, Nahum 319. It was such a cruel and wicked city that people clapped their hands and rejoiced when it fell. And the name Nahum, whose book is full of judgment, Nahum means comfort, because it was a comfort to the people of God, the nations of the world, when such a wicked, violent, cruel nation fell. We rejoice at the salvation of the lost, but heaven also rejoices when God's glorified in the judgment of the unrepentant wicked. For the Lord hath made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. Right. Now, it is true that like God, we should be burdened for the lost and want to see them saved. But it's also true that if they refuse to get saved, we must glorify God for his justice and uh, in all things give him glory. God glorifies himself in the judgment of the wicked and yet at the same time, he has no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. His justice is glorified when sin is judged and things are made right, but he still loves people and sent Christ to die for him. And somehow our hearts need to be large enough to take in all of that. There's a book back there called The Lake of Fire. It talks about a devastating doctrine, the doctrine of hell. One section in the book talks about how a God of love and justice must send people to hell who reject Christ. Another section called the agony talks about what it's like for people to live in hell right now. And it's so bad, it's hard to imagine. Another section called The Appeal talks about the implications of the doctrine of hell for lost people and the implications of the doctrine of hell for saved people. In the book, I give some 15 reasons to help us understand why a God of love and justice must send people to hell who reject Christ. But even with my reasons, which are helpful, 
it's still hard to imagine friends, neighbors, a nice man down the street who is cast into a lake of fire because of his sins and his refusal to accept Christ. Hell is clearly taught by the Bible, and it's an, it's an awesome doctrine. The worse hell is, the greater Christ's love is because he bore all of our penalties so we wouldn't have to go there. It's an interesting doctrine. But it's a devastating doctrine. And I want to say something that I hope will be comforting. Because I, I need comfort. Those who are nearest to the heart and mind of God that is, those who have the clearest vision and deepest understanding of things. Praise the Lord, not for his mercy only, but also for his wrath, as is the case here when all of heaven celebrates the destruction of the godless world system. Remember, those who are now in heaven, the angels, the glorified saints, they praise God with hallelujahs or God's judgment on the wicked. And what that tells me is we might see people being judged and struggle with that. But people who are much more knowledgeable than we are and much more spiritual than we are, those in heaven, those who are closest to God and see things through his eyes more clearly, they praise God for his judgment as well as for his mercy. That doesn't mean that we don't struggle with the doctrine of hell. But it does mean that the more we know and the better we see, the better perspective we'll have and know that whatever the Bible teaches is true. That's true of any difficulty in the Bible or any difficulty in your life. Psalm 119, 151 says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. The closer you get to God and the more you see things in the light of his presence, the more you will whisper in admiration, all thy commandments are truth, everything this word teaches. We read in Psalm 36, 9, for with thee is a fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. The closer we get to God, the more clearly we see things through his eyes, the more we'll love and appreciate all the teachings of this book and know that he does all things well and works all things together for good in our lives, even though there are things that sometimes we have trouble figuring out or our past finding out, but we can trust God with them. Amen. Job had a million questions to ask God, but when he finally met him, they all fled his mind. He said, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes see of thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He had a million questions to ask God, but when God met him at the end of the book, God made it so real to him that God is love, wisdom, justice, and power, perfect, that anything I still don't fully understand, I can leave with him because I know he does. And in the final analysis, try as best as I can to follow on to know, and that's a continuing process. But in the final analysis, all I need to know as th is that he knows. I know he knows. Amen. I know by the deepest experience and the soundest logic and uh, the greatest authority. I know that God is a God of infinite holiness and love and beauty and justice. And I can trust him with what I still can't understand and in time, try to let my understanding catch up a little more. 
In Revelation 19.5, there's a voice that comes from the throne and says, Praise ye God, praise ye our God, ye his servants, and all ye that fear him, both small and great. When it comes to worshiping God, we're all on level ground. Whether you're a millionaire or whether you're struggling to make ends meet at the end of the month. <laughs> We're all on level ground, and we all need to fear him, both small and great. Before the throne of God, all human distinctions and all sense of self-importance are lost. In the words of Oliver Wendell Holmes, before thy ever blazing throne, we ask no luster of our own. Well, in these verses that Brother Bill read, we have heaven's fourfold hallelujah chorus. Now, in our King James, it says hallelujah, but that's the same as hallelujah. In the Hebrew, it's hallelujah that comes into the English. The word hallelujah means praise ye the Lord, and it's a Hebrew word, hallelujah and you bring the letters of the Hebrew into English and you get hallelujah, but it's translated praise ye the Lord. But when the Hebrew Old Testament was translated into Greek around 200 years before Christ, that translation is called the Septuagint. Uh, the Greek word for hallelujah comes into the English as hallelujah. It still means praise ye the Lord. So hallelujah reflects the Greek influence on the word hallelujah in the New Testament, since the New Testament was written in Greek. But the word hallelujah or alleluia is found only four times in our New Testament, and all those four times are here in Revelation 19, 1 through 6. And this is heaven's fourfold hallelujah chorus. And it takes my mind back to the end of the book of Psalms. The end of the book of Psalms ends in a crescendo of praise. Amen. Now, Psalms and all that the psalmist goes through is a picture of our life in all of its varied circumstances, taking everything into the presence of God. But when we get to the end, we're in Beulah land. Amen. It's filled with praise. And uh, the word praise if I remember correctly, is found 180 times in Psalms, but it's concentrated in the end. Psalms 145 through 150, you have 46 references to praise. Amen. It ends on a note of praise. And Psalm 145 is an acrostic of praise. Each one of the 22 verses of Psalm 145 begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. They call that an acrostic. And uh, it's an acrostic of praise. The whole psalm glorifies how wonderful God is in his kingdom. And then after we get past this acrostic of praise, Psalm 145, we have hallelujah psalms, 146 through 150. Psalms 146 through 150 are called Hallelujah Psalms because each psalm both begins and ends with Hallelujah or Praise Ye the Lord. And so Psalms goes out in a glorious crescendo of praise and it ends in Psalm 150, verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And uh, as we get to the end of present history, uh, heaven's going to be filled with praises. Amen. Now, the fourth hallelujah is the greatest of all. In Revelation 19, verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, omnipotent, reigneth. The fourth and final alleluia reverberates with triumph. In the words of Psalm 106, 47, we are to triumph in thy praise. Talk about sound effects. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, 
and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. The praise is loud, deep, and full, and characterized by strength and grandeur. When Queen Victoria of England first heard Handel's great oratorio, The Messiah, she was a young queen, and she was told that the practice was that when they came to the Hallelujah Chorus, everybody was to stand to his feet. But because she was the queen of the British Empire, she was to remain seated. So when they came to the Hallelujah Chorus, everybody stood to his feet as one man. But the queen did as she was supposed to do. She stayed seated. But as she heard the orchestra and the choir singing great verses from Revelation, like, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. King of kings, Lord of lords. She um, was just thrilled in her soul. And when they came to the words of Revelation eleven fifteen, if my understanding is correct, the kingdoms of this world are become. The kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Amen and he shall reign forever and ever, Amen. she quietly stood to her feet, tears streaming down her face. Much later in life, she added to that experience by saying, I gladly lay the crown of the British Empire at the feet of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. This question might seem to be a bolt out of the blue, but I think this is a good place to ask it. Is Satan going to win out in the end? Is Satan going to win out in the end? I believe no is the correct answer. <laughs> Another way you can ask the question is, is darkness stronger than light? And in asking it, you've really answered it, haven't you? Darkness is not stronger than light. Darkness can only exist in the absence of light. Right. If you walk into a dark room and flip on a light switch, the light takes over. Yes, it does. Whenever light and darkness meet, light always wins. Amen. And uh, the darkness cannot comprehend or overcome the light. Right. In fact, uh, all the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. It can only make it seem like it's burning brighter. So who is, what is stronger, good or evil? Light or darkness, God or Satan? You can't go up against God Almighty by definition and hope to win. And so I believe you are certainly right when you respond, no to the question, is Satan going to win out in the end? But as I was reading in Dr. Boa's book on world religions and cults and the occult, this scholar pointed out that Satan worshipers are basically of two kinds. Those who kind of go into it for kind of a sick thrill, but those who are hardcore and have devoted their lives to the devil and his cause. Um, I heard a converted hell's angel say at a church back in North Carolina years ago, there are two kinds of hell's angels. There are those who um, are just kind of in it to, I guess, kind of show off. But then the hardcore <coughs> hell's angels believe that they are preparing the way for Antichrist and uh, are his dedicated servants. And this man who was a converted hell's angel was telling us about this and said that God was protecting him because there were attempts on his life for his conversion. Um, but the hardcore devil worshipers believe that in the end, Satan's gonna win. And he is going to reward all of his faithful followers with all kinds of pleasure and uh, rewards. What a false and foolish fantasy. Right. Amen. Come on. By definition, God cannot be defeated. 
He's omnipotent. He's almighty. No matter how great something finite is, no matter how beautiful, no matter how strong, no matter how smart, there's always, by definition, an infinite gap between the finite and the infinite, between the created and the creator. Young man, young man, your arms too short to box with God. You can't go up against Almighty God and hope to win. But then there's another reason why this is a foolish fantasy. The devil's a liar and simply can't be trusted. What makes you think that if you help them get to the top, he would then keep his word, and not turn right. on you? You know, you're trusting a liar. Yeah. So it's a, it's a no-win situation to start with. But when all of heaven rings out, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That shows us where history is going to end up. And uh, God will reign victorious. Amen. Well, then we have the second announcement in verses 7 through 10, and that's the announcement concerning the marriage supper of the Lamb. We had the announcement of the fall of the great Babylon and all of heaven saying, Alleluia. But now we have the announcement of the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19, 7 through 10. Would somebody read for that for us in a good, loud voice? Let us be glad and rejoice and give him honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And as her was granted, she should be arranged in five men Thank you, Brother Dean. If they who are invited to the marriage supper are pronounced blessed, how much more blessed is the beautiful bride herself? You and me, the church. <laughs> J. Vernon McGee commented, I've never seen an ugly bride. The dear dean of our Bible college and seminary for many years, Dr. Edward Coghill, tells the story that when he and his future father-in-law were waiting at the side door about to go out into the main sanctuary for the wedding to start, Dr. Coghill said that his soon-to-be father-in-law commented, she's too lovely to give away. Well, the church is going to be beautiful. I wasn't prepared to see you look like a fairy princess in a storybook. Your shining eyes through clouds of tall brought tears that shook my visage calm. I tried but failed to take in stride the breathtaking sight of you as a bride. The lamb's wife have made herself ready, and she will be a beautiful bride. Unto her it was granted that she should be arrayed in linen clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Question, who can name the three stages of getting married among the ancient Jewish people? The ancient Jewish marriage ceremony involved three steps. Do you know what they were? 
okay, engagement. What was the more technical word for that back then? Betrothal, okay. We would call that engagement today, which is helpful as far as it goes, but the engagement back then was a very strict legally binding matter. Uh, so you have the betrothal or the engagement. What's the second? Okay. Um, I, what's that? Uh, that's, that's all connected. The word I was kind of looking for was procession. But the, <laughs> the bride would wait for the procession from the bridegroom's house, and so she would be waiting, and it would lead to the wedding, so all that ties in. But the second step would be the procession, and the third would be the ceremony. You could say that. Um, marriage supper is what I was looking for, but the first night of the marriage supper would be the ceremony, so it ties in. Um, the betrothal, the procession, and the marriage supper basically were the three main parts of an ancient Jewish wedding. Now, it could differ, but usually about a year before the uh, ceremony would take place, the bridegroom's father, sometimes accompanied by the groom himself, would go to the young lady's house and they would work out a marriage contract. Now this was very legally binding, a betrothal contract. The Old Testament taught that once the betrothal contract was arranged, the bride and groom legally belonged to each other and had to be very true to each other, even though they weren't live together and enter into the fullness of the relationship until after the procession. They were committed to each other. So according to the Old Testament law, if one was untrue to the other sexually, uh, that was considered adultery and meant the death penalty. It was a legally binding marriage arrangement, stricter than our divorce. Uh, see, this was the situation that dear Joseph was in um, he learned that Mary was with child. You could always say that if he had been more open to studying the scriptures and knew about the prophecy of the virgin birth, it might have been easier for him to have um, believed Mary's account. But uh, how many of us are all we need to be spiritually when it comes to living up to the challenges of the word? Um, Certainly, we do not want to judge there. Uh, but when he learned that Mary was with child, humanly speaking, the only thing that he could have concluded was that she was unfaithful. And they were committed to each other in that strict engagement called betrothal. Had Joseph pressed the letter of the law, he could have had Mary stoned. But being a just and merciful man, and with his heart breaking, and not wanting Mary to go through any unnecessary pain, and kind of at a loss to understand, he was minded to put her away privately. But while he wrestled and thought on those things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream and said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Uh, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, etc. cetera. And, um, uh, but this was during the betrothal period. And they were committed to each other. But there was a very wonderful reason, not a bad reason, why Mary is with child, and Joseph would learn of that. Um, and we celebrate that all around the world every Christmas. Amen. But that was the betrothal. Now... It was important that a dowry price be paid to the bride's family for the privilege. It was a patriarchal society. The bride would leave her father's house and come and live in the bridegroom's father's family. And uh, a woman back then would be an economic asset, and uh, the family had to be compensated. Also, sometimes if the wife were divorced or put away, 
it was very hard for her to fend to her, for herself back then. Many people think that in the parable of the lost coin, those 10 coins that that woman had were part of a dowry price, uh, which was very special to her, but would be something that would help provide for her should her husband die or abuse her or divorce her. So a dowry price would be a way of saying, I place value on the woman I'm going to marry. And the dowry price, whatever it would be, would go to compensate the bride's family, but she would keep some of it too uh, for the future. And uh, that was an important part. Um, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, a ring was involved, and the Bible says that when Christ betrothed us to himself, um, uh, we became sealed with the Holy Spirit uh, unto the final day of redemption. And uh, so the Holy Spirit, in a sense, is like the wedding ring. And what was the dowry price that Christ paid? His own blood. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He bought the church with his blood. Now, we had a dear student at Tabernacle years ago. Some of you may know of him, Peter Nielsen. Peter came from Kenya. And um, he spent five years studying with us. And he's now serving the Lord and teaching in Kenya. And he's married, and he and Barita have two dear children. But when Peter went back to Kenya after being with us five years, he fell in love with Berita and wanted to marry her. But in Kenya, you have to come up with a dowry price. And in Peter's case, to receive Berita's hand, he had to come up with eight cows. And uh, cows are expensive. And uh, he didn't have that much money. And so people prayed, and uh, some people at the college helped chip in and all. And uh, eventually he got the money to buy the eight cows to give to Burita's family, and that was the dowry price. But we were so valuable to Christ. He wanted to marry us so much. Can you imagine? Amen. That he gave his infinite blood in full payment for our sins on the cross to purchase us unto himself. So when Christ came into the world and shed his blood, and when he comes into our hearts, that's the betrothal. We commit ourselves to him. He commits himself to us, and there should be a holy <laughs> jealousy not to uh, give any of our love that Christ deserves to the world, right. but to him alone. Paul said, I am jealous over you, Church of Corinth, with a godly jealousy, uh, because I want to present you someday as a chaste virgin to Christ. Uh, and I don't want Satan to, by any means, as he deceived Eve, to deceive you and have you give your love to the world. And Paul said, I'm kind of acting as um, a friend of the bridegroom to help the church, the bride, remain true to Christ until she can be presented pure and holy to him someday. And Jesus is getting us ready for that right now because we read in Ephesians 5 that he might sanctify and cleanse his church with the washing of the water by the word so that someday at the marriage supper he can present it unto himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle. But we should seek to remain true to Christ alone. <coughs> We're promised to him. And also grow more and more in our spiritual character to be a fit companion to him someday. And God uses the word to help the church become more and more like the bride she wants to be, both privately and in the public services of the church and in Sunday school. Now, Paul's writing the husbands there and saying, just as Christ sanctifies the church through the word, you need to help develop your wife spiritually through a teaching ministry in her life. 
I know there are some women who know the Bible better than their husbands. I know there are some women who are a lot smarter than their husbands academically. But a man, as the spiritual leader of his house, should know the Bible well enough that he can take it and guide his wife in holiness and service. In many churches, the wife knows the Bible a whole lot better than the husband and is much more dedicated to the church than the husband. In fact, Warren Wiersbe said that he had a pastor friend years ago who had so much trouble getting the men in his church involved in doing anything. I'm so glad this is not true of New Hope. But this pastor said he had so much trouble getting the men in his church involved in anything that he actually accused the men in the church of changing the words to that great old hymn, take my life and let it be, to take my wife and let me be. <laughs> and uh, the husband is able to know, should know the Bible well enough that he can apply it to his wife's life in the love of the Holy Spirit to help her be more and more Christ-like. But many times, the husband has very little interest in spiritual things, is very biblically illiterate, and sometimes will even give the wife a hard time if she even tries to take the kids to church if he wants to do something else during that time. And, uh, and that's really tragic. <laughs> Rise up, O men of God. Be done with lesser things with heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God, the church for you doth wait. Her strength unequal to the task. Rise up and make her great. But Christ is getting the church ready now. The Holy Spirit through the word tells us all about what Jesus is like. So even though we have not seen him face to face, we love him and long to see him return and enter into a greater relationship. If to know Christ as we can now know him down here by faith is heaven on earth, what will it be like to know him as we shall someday know him by sight in heaven, if not the very heaven of heavens? The wonder Paul says in Philippians 1.21, to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because if Christ is our life right now, when we die and go to heaven, we'll experience more of Christ who's our life. And so that's gain. Gain is having more of something that you already have. And if Christ is your life now and you'll know him better in heaven, then that's gain. Yep. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. 1 Peter 1.8. We don't see Christ face to face like we will at the marriage supper someday. But through the Spirit of God and the Word of God, we already are experiencing him and looking forward to a greater revelation. When Rebecca got on that camel and traveled some 450 miles from northern Mesopotamia to be the bride of Isaac in Palestine. One thing made that weary, tiresome, long journey worthwhile. She continued to ask the servant who was sent there for the express purpose of bringing her to Isaac. She kept asking him about his miraculous birth his long-awaited promised birth, uh, his personal dignity and loveliness, his willing sacrifice on Moriah, where it would be said on the mount of the Lord it would be provided, um, how he was heir of all of Abraham's vast wealth. She continued to ask questions, what he's like, what's he like, so that it says literally in the Hebrew, in chapter 24 of Genesis, when it says Rebecca lit off her camel, literally she fell off her camel. I believe she was so excited she couldn't wait to meet him. She put the veil on to indicate modesty, but she was excited. And the Spirit of God through the Word of God tells us how wonderful Jesus is. So though we see him not, 
believing that this is true, we love him and look forward more and more to entering into a greater dimension of that relationship. Amen. And he's getting us ready for that right now. Amen. Through the washing of the water by the word, that he might present us unto himself a glorious church. But then the second stage is the procession, where the bridegroom and his attendants would proceed to go to the bridegroom, bride's house. Now, we're told that where customs, ancient customs are still observed in Israel, if it hasn't gotten too modernized, more in the villages, you see this a lot more when Bible customs books were written in the 1900s. But a man might be a peasant, a girl might be a peasant, but on that procession, they were the talk of the town. And I've read Bible customs books that would say that they might go through the uh, streets of the city at night. Torches would be lit or lanterns or, or lamps. Uh, women would look out the windows as the procession went by and make all kinds of <laughs> ah! sounds, uh, we're told. And it was, it was the event of the year. Uh, sometimes the princess, the, sometimes the, the man, though he were a peasant, would wear a crown, the, girl would have a crown, it would be an event, the streets would be lined, and he would go to that bride. Now, she had a general idea of when he was coming, but she didn't know the exact time, and it was very important that she be ready with her maidens to follow him back to the father's house. He would go with his attendants, he would get the bride, and then he would, she and her attendants would accompany him through the streets of the city in a great procession back to the father's house. That's the second stage. And Christ said, in my Father's house are many mansions, literally abiding places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Christ betrothed this to himself, He's now going back to the Father's house and he's preparing those special rooms just for his bride. If this earth, even after the fall, is so beautiful and breathtaking and brilliant and bright, and it took only six days to create, how beautiful do you think those mansions are that Jesus has been getting ready for you and me, his chosen bride? for some 2,000 years now. He's gonna come back at the rapture and sweep the church off her feet, take her back to heaven and carry her across those thresholds, and that's the procession. And we believe he could come back tonight, and our prayer is even so, come, Lord Jesus. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Hope of all our hopes to some. Take thy waiting people home. Long so long this groaning earth, cursed with war and flood and dearth, longs for its redemption birth. Therefore come we daily pray, bring the resurrection day, wipe creation's curse away. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Well, the third stage is then the wedding supper. It would usually last seven days, and uh, you'd have a wedding ceremony, and then the first night of the wedding supper, the uh, couple would spend the first night together, and all of the friends and family would celebrate the glorious union for seven days at the marriage supper. And um, what we do at the Lord's Supper table is a preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Jesus spoke when he instituted the Lord's Supper that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine with you until I drink it with you new in the kingdom of my Father. When we remember the Lord Jesus' finished work as a church through the sharing of the elements, the Lord's table, 
that is in preparation for the time when we'll see him someday face to face and sit with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And uh, Abraham and Isaac will sit down there too. And many shall come from the north, north and south and east and west and shall sit down uh, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So these three um, stages of getting married among the ancient Hebrews wonderfully parallels uh, Christ's relationship with the church. There is a very godly and dear prophetic scholar <coughs> was my wife's dear pastor in Philadelphia many years ago named Reynolds Showers. His son is now the uh, director of Friends of Israel. But uh, Reynolds Showers years ago preached a sermon and put it in uh, pamphlet form called Behold the Bridegroom Cometh. And he goes into these three stages and explains them very clearly and beautifully. Uh, if you ever get your hands on that pamphlet, it's worth reading. Uh, Behold the Bridegroom Cometh by Reynolds Showers. Does the marriage supper of the Lamb take place in heaven or on earth or both? What do you think? Okay, Pastor and Danny speak about heaven. Yes, sir. Oh, say that a little louder, please. I think that's worth considering. I think that's worth considering. Anyone else? You know, this is interesting. We weren't planning to get into this, this conference, but we at New Hope Independent Baptist Church believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. Amen. That is, we believe that Christ will come back for his church and take her to heaven before the seven years of the tribulation period. So his rapture of the church is pre-tribulational or before the tribulation. One reason I believe that is because the true church is conspicuous by her absence in all the passages of the Bible that deal with the tribulation. The most extensive and detailed passage in all the Bible on the tribulation is Revelation 6, 1 through 19, 10. And you will find the true church nowhere on earth in that section. Right. And when it comes to reaching the world with the gospel, God uses 144,000 Jewish people and others. Well, the church was given, the Great Commission was given to the church during the church age. Why isn't the church doing that in the tribulation? Well, I don't believe the church is here in the tribulation. I believe she's raptured. Amen. And God is taking up his dealings with Israel again, uh, preparing for the second advent of Christ and his kingdom. Of course, the rapture is the first phase of that second advent as he comes for his saints. And then when he comes back to reign, he'll come back with his saints. But the church is found in Revelation 6, 1 through 19, 10, but not on earth, in heaven, at the marriage supper. And so since the church is in heaven at the marriage supper, it would make me think that um, the marriage supper begins in heaven. But remember, Christ is going to enter into <coughs> full marriage with the church at the marriage supper. Now, the holy city in Revelation 21 is called the bride, the lamb's wife. Dr. Mount says that the bride indicates the um, uh, purity of the church and the uh, wife indi indicates the intimacy, and both are true. But Christ will enter into fuller relations with the church when they see each other face to face. We already have that in Christ relationship right now in the church age, but we'll see him face to face someday. And um, he's the king. And so if we're his wife, <laughs> makes us the queen. Paul said, know you not that the saints will judge the world? Amen. 
we will judge angels. <laughs> if the one man's pound makes 10 pounds, Jesus says, you'll start ruling over 10 cities. Revelation, Luke 19, 16 and 17. Some fantastic implications here. Christ is the king, we're the queen. We're coming back to share his rule in the millennium and in the new heavens and earth. There's some fantastic possibilities here. Um, but I believe it begins in heaven. But you have a number of passages that speak of the marriage supper on earth too. Uh, many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, uh, Matthew 8, 12. Uh, the Lord of hosts will, uh, on this mountain, create a feast of fat things and of wine on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the leaves, leaves well refined. The Lord God will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that's uh, spread over all nations. He will swallow up death and victory. He'll wipe tears from every eyes and the rebuke of his people shall he remove from off all the earth. In this mountain, Mount Zion, he's going to destroy death through the resurrection of Christ. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. And on this mountain, he's going to create a feast of fat things, of wine on the leaves. Eaves, uh, uh, wine on the leaves. Uh, the Lord of hosts is going to be the host, if you please. At this great marriage supper, that's going to, I believe, last through the millennium. I believe the marriage supper starts in heaven but then it's continued for the thousand years. That honeymoon is celebrated for a thousand years as all of earth rejoices and celebrates the marriage of Christ to his church and uh, their rule over the millennial earth. It seems to me. The marriage supper of the lamb ends the longest engagement in history. <laughs> Some 2000 years and counting. And the honeymoon, if I'm interpreting this correctly, will last a thousand years, the entire millennium, as the earth celebrates uh, this wonderful marriage of the king and queen. The supper, the Greek word supper, referred to the evening meal among the Hebrews, which to the Jew meant the beginning of the new day. Remember, the Jewish day started around 6 p.m., this is reflected in the creation account of Genesis 1, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. And so uh, the supper is the evening meal, but to a Hebrew, that would mean the beginning of a new day. And I think spiritually speaking, the marriage supper of the Lamb is the beginning of a new day for all the world. <laughs> it speaks about Christ coming back with his bride to rule and reign with his saints a thousand years. His kingdom is coming, oh tell me the story. God's banner exalted shall be. The earth shall be filled with his wondering glory as waters that cover the sea. Now, here's a very important and practical question. What is the close connection between the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb? What is the close connection between the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why are they wonderfully connected? I believe they're separated in time by seven years, but I do believe they are wonderfully connected. The Bible, I believe, teaches that there will be a short period of time between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation period. I believe represented by the throne room scene of Revelation 4 and 5. John in Revelation 4, 1 is called up to heaven. Come up hither, and I will show thee things which shall be hereafter. Metatauta in the Greek, literally the things which shall be after these things. I believe the things of the churches in the church age. I believe we begin things future in Revelation 4, 1. And I believe John is a picture of the raptured church caught up to heaven after the things of the church age. Right. Wouldn't be dogmatic, but I, I, I believe that's a good way to understand it. So if John represents the raptured church in Revelation 4.1, and you have the praise to the creator and to the lamb in chapters 4 and 5, and the lamb doesn't break the first seal until Revelation 6.1 and 2, 
where the Antichrist rides on a white horse going forth conquering in the conquer. It's only when that Antichrist rises to power and becomes the head of a 10 nation revived Roman Empire in the West that he's in a position to sign the political peace pact for seven years with Israel, now back in the land, but in unbelief in Daniel 9, 27. It starts a seven year tribulation, if I'm understanding that correctly. The Bible says Israel will go back into the land, but in unbelief. When Jesus comes back, she'll look upon him whom she's pierced and be wonderfully converted as a nation. But she does go back into the land, the bones are coming together, but she's back in unbelief. And in that situation, she will enter into what the Hebrew says is a firm covenant with the Roman leader in the West, the Antichrist. It'll be a covenant for seven years in the midst of which he'll break it and turn on her. But the Antichrist, it seems to me, has to be in position in the West before he can sign that political peace pact as the Western ruler of Israel and the Middle East. We read in Daniel 7 that the Antichrist is a little horn that rises on the head of the fourth kingdom. And three of the horns or leaders oppose him and he defeats them. And then the other seven willingly give their authority to him. And uh, the other three no doubt are replaced. And now he's in charge of a 10 nation revived Roman Empire in the West. I believe it's only in that position does he enter into a covenant with Israel and sign the seven year peace pact, which is the tribulation period. But he's still rising the power in connection with the Lamb's breaking of the first seal in 6, 1 and 2. And if John represents the raptured church in Revelation 4, 1, the church is already in heaven before the tribulation begins. This is one reason why we believe that while the rapture will occur before the tribulation, the tribulation won't begin immediately after the rapture, there'll be, I believe, a short time period. And I believe that in that short time period, you'll have the judgment seat of Christ. I believe in the flexibility of symbolism, those 24 elders represent the church. It says they're seated on seats, literally the Greek word is thrones, thronoi. They're clothed in white robes and they already have crowns of gold which at the end of the chapter, they'll cast at the Lord's feet. The 24 elders seated on thrones and clothed and crowned in Revelation 4.4, 4, I believe represent the church already having been at the judgment seat of Christ and rewarded. I believe the judgment seat of Christ takes place right after the rapture very early in that transition period, before the seven year tribulation begins. The marriage supper of the Lamb happens at the very end of that seven year period in Revelation 19, seven through 10, because Christ comes back in verse 11, leading the armies of heaven back to the earth. So that's why I say, I believe there'll be a, about a seven year period between the two, but they are wonderfully connected in terms of their meaning. And what is that connection? This is not an easy question. When it says that the fine linen that is given to the church is the righteousness of saints, in the Greek it's plural. The righteousnesses of saints, the righteous acts of the saints. This is interesting. When we become part of the bride of Christ at salvation. We receive the righteousness of Christ. We're fully clothed in his perfect finished work and his perfect obedience. And God sees us fully righteous or justified in his sight. We receive the righteousness of Christ at salvation. And then God's working in our lives to make us more spiritual in our actual conduct to present us to Christ someday. Well, you might say that the judgment seat of Christ puts the finishing touches, in a sense, on that um, sanctification process. 
I know that ultimately death is the last step in the sanctification process or the rapture. Uh, but there's a sense in which the judgment seat of Christ puts it all in perspective. Christ is sanctifying the church right now through the washing of the water by the word. Amen. That someday he might present it unto himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. We receive the righteousness of Christ, the salvation. But according to the Greek text, the fine linen, clean and white, that represents the bridal gown, is the righteous acts of the saints. That means everything you do in Jesus' name for the Lord in your Christian life and service is contributing to the making up of the wedding gown. Yep. Amen. Every time you lead the recreation program at Vacation Bible School and take time working with children, every time you volunteer your time to clean the church, every time you uh, help a young person with his homework, every time you teach a Sunday school class and take extra time with a child maybe from an underprivileged home, and maybe doesn't know the gospel. Um, anything you do for the Lord, even giving a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, writing out a card saying, we missed you in Sunday school, hope you'll come this Sunday, I'll pick you up, or whatever. All of that are righteous acts that form the wedding gown. We receive the righteousness of Christ at salvation but will be presented with the works we've done for him throughout church history at the marriage supper. And uh, the judgment seat of Christ is to kind of uh, do the final cleaning and uh, ironing. Our works in and of themselves are imperfect, though they're acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Right. But anything we do for Jesus uh, is going to form the wedding garment. But some of the things that we think we're doing for Jesus are just wood, hay, and stubble. They'll be burned up at the fire of the judgment seat in that evaluation. Only what's truly done for Christ will shine forth forever at the judgment seat, the gold, silver, and precious stones that pass through the fire of testing. And so all of the, humanly speaking, wrinkles and stains that are still on our garment of righteous acts will be wonderfully removed at the judgment seat of Christ, if you will. So all we've done for Jesus, now wonderfully processed at the judgment seat of Christ, will constitute the wedding gown with which we're presented to him. It's the righteousness of Christ that makes us the bride, but it's what we do for Jesus in terms of righteousness in our lives and in the church that provide that wonderful gown to make us even more beautiful to be presented to him in. Uh, we have a beautiful picture of uh, Christ's marriage in the church in Psalm 45, and it says that the bride is all glorious within, and um, uh, will we'll be beautiful for Jesus in terms of the lives and service we've given to him, as well as what we are to him as his chosen one. And Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 talks about this. It says, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's what makes us the church. That he might, uh, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. He's getting us ready right now. That someday at the marriage supper, he might present us unto himself a glorious church. Amen. Jesus loves the church. The church is important to Jesus. It's glorious in his eyes, and he's making it glorious. The church is important. Some people speak of a post-Christian age as if Christianity is no longer relevant in our world, and the church is largely neglected and passe. The carpenter is more than a carpenter. He built the universe, and he was also a very good carpenter. And he said, I will build my church and he will complete anything he's built. There's no post-Christian age. He's building the church right now. Yep. He'll continue to build it until the end of church history. And the church is important to him, and you're an important part of what's being done by him. And this church here is important. Amen. It's going to be presented to him a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, but any such thing, 
but that it should be holding without blemish. As it were, any wrinkle, any blemish, will be ironed out and cleansed at the judgment seat, as it were. All the wood, hay, and stubble will be removed, so only what was truly done for Jesus uh, will count and uh, shine forth for all of eternity. Daniel 12.3 puts it like this, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And as one old Puritan writer said, to have just one more pearl added to your crown, he said, you will give all of heaven and earth for it. I do wonder whether that works in reverse in hell. That those who are suffering in hell, would they give all of heaven and earth to have one less sin to answer for, for all of eternity? Jesus is getting us ready for some great things in the future as his queen ruling with him over the earth and throughout the new heavens and earth. One writer puts it so beautifully. He says, beloved, Christ has betrothed you to him. You are to spend eternity in his palace and on his throne. You are to be the companion and partner of his mightiest enterprises in the ages to come. Perhaps with him you were to colonize a constellation of space and govern the boundless universe of God. Do you know he is educating you now to be a fit companion for such a kingdom? Will you let him love you all he wants to and fit you for such a destiny as will someday fill you with everlasting wonder and adoring love? Well, what John is seeing in heaven is so overwhelming that great theologian and man of God that he is, in an inconsistent moment, he falls down at the feet of the angel who's showing him all this, and he's lovingly rebuked. I'm a fellow servant. This worship's reserved, the reserved for God alone. Worship God. See, that's one of the reasons we know Jesus is God. Because God will not give his glory to another, neither his praise to a graven image. God is jealous of the glory that's due unto his holy name. But at the name of Jesus, someday every knee will bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God wants every knee to bow to Christ and give him all glory, Lord, and honor as they would to the Father. That would be inappropriate if Jesus were a mere creature. God doesn't give his glory to another, but it's to the glory of God that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. As the Lord Jesus put it so well in John 5, 22 and 23, the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which have sent him. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I think what that means is, Jesus is the heartbeat of prophecy. Jesus is the one that all the prophets point to. I tried to go into that somewhat in that small book. We have found him as we look into the Old Testament and say, where can we see Christ in the Old Testament and give some examples. Uh, I believe the whole Old Testament is about Jesus as well as the new. And uh, I believe you can summarize the Bible in terms of the three C's. The three C's is what I like to call them. When I was on the faculty at Pensacola Christian College in the early years of the school, um, they had a Bible conference and the campus church, which was on Rawson Lane, if you packed it, if you, if you packed it out, it would sit, seat 600 people. 
but for the Bible conference with the church people and the growing student body and the visitors from town and the guests, uh, the church could not hold that number. They had not built the Dale W. Horton Auditorium yet, which would hold 3,000. And so what they did is they met in the gym, which could hold comfortably about 1,500. And uh, they made use of every bit of space. The faculty was put on the gym platform. And then all the students were seated in three sections on the gym floor below or in the bleachers on either side. And they had a speaker there from Heart to Heart Bible Church in Phoenix, Arizona. His name was Dr. Hitchcock, and I still remember this. Dr. Hitchcock said, I can tell you how you can go out of here knowing the whole Bible, knowing the whole Bible. Now, you can spend a lifetime trying to know the Bible in greater detail, all 1,189 chapters, all 31,100 verses, all some 3,000 names and character descriptions, hundreds of important subjects of great theology and great practice. You'll spend your lifetime and feel like you're still only scratching the surface. But Dr. Hitchcock said in terms of having a basic grasp of what the Bible's all about, you can go out of here knowing the whole Bible if you'll just learn three simple statements. And he says they're not hard to learn. If you can just memorize three simple statements, you will walk out of here and you'll know the whole Bible. And I think what he meant is then, as you study, it'll just be a question of having everything put under its proper category and fitting it in. But you'll basically know the Bible. So he says, I want you to memorize these three statements. I want to help you. Still remember this. He said, all of you on I can't remember now whether there were three um, sections down below, and he did it with all three. I think maybe there were two sections, and he used the faculty and staff as one of the sections in the back. But it was something like, I want everybody in this section to repeat after me. Christ is coming. And so they repeated, Christ is coming. Amen. And then he may have turned to us in the back. I can't quite remember how he did it now. But he said, you repeat after me. Christ has come. So everybody in that section repeated, Christ has come. And then he turned to this section over here on the gym floor, and he said, repeat after me, Christ is coming again. And they said, Christ is coming again. And he says, if you can memorize those three statements, you'll walk out of this gymnasium knowing the whole Bible because it's all about Friday. Christ coming. Christ is coming. Christ has come, Christ is coming again. I call those the three C's. The whole Bible is built around Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. Or you could understand it in terms of the three A's. In the Old Testament, God appears to men. In the Gospels, God abides with men. In the Acts and Epistles, God abounds in men. And I think of that wonderful verse in Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I have been accused over the years of being garrulous, circumlocutious, and loquacious, <laughs> whatever they mean. I think they have something to do with taking too much time to get to the point and talking around the subject too much. I've been accused of that, and it hurts. I have been accused of giving people directions from Gloucester, to Norfolk by way of San Francisco. <laughs> and it hurts. But I want you to know that if I work at it, and yes, I really got to work at it, but if I work at it, I can be succinct, whatever that means. I think it has something to do with being able to say exactly what you mean simply. I have to work at it. 
But I want to prove to you that if I really work at it, I could be succinct, okay? And so I'm going to try to give you the theme of the entire Bible in a single sentence. Let's see if we can do it, okay? The theme of the entire Bible in a single sentence. The theme of the entire Bible in a single sentence is the redemption of a fallen creation through the risen Christ. The theme of the entire Bible in a single sentence is the redemption of a fallen creation through the risen Christ. Amen. Peter puts it like this in Acts 10.43, to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Or as Revelation 19.10 puts it, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We next come to Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Uh, brother, yes, sir. I hate to interrupt, but would you repeat that last fallen? Oh, oh, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. The theme of the entire Bible in a single sentence is the redemption of a fallen creation through the risen Christ. Remember, Christ is another word for Messiah. Christos or Christ comes into the English from the Greek. Messiah or the Hebrew, Mashiach, comes into the English through the Hebrew, but they both mean the anointed one. So we're talking about the promised Messiah here when we talk about the risen Christ, the one who was promised all through the Old Testament. And the theme of the entire Bible in a single sentence is the redemption of a fallen creation through the risen Christ. Another way you could put it is that the Old Testament is the life of a nation, Israel. The New Testament is the life of a man, even the man Christ Jesus. The chief purpose of the nation was to produce the man. Remember in Abraham and in his seed would all the families of the earth be blessed through the seed, the seed of the woman, Messiah. The Old Testament is the life of a nation. The New Testament is the life of a man. The chief purpose of the nation was to produce the man. And the chief purpose of the man was to save the world. I love that summary of scripture. And it ties in well with Galatians 3.8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Galatians 3.8. Well, in Revelation 19.11-21, with power and great glory, Christ leads the army of glory against all the enemies of Israel at Armageddon. And all the fierce fowl of heaven are gorged with the flesh of the armies of Antichrist. We will pick up that study at a later time. But I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, it's great to have you. I think this might be a good time to maybe just pray and say good night. But does anybody have a comment or maybe a question that you'd like to share before we close in prayer? <laughs> I did go a mile too long, but I did remember what, what I was told last year that if I turn into the McDonald's, I couldn't see the sign for the motel coming up. I went a mile out of my way and I said, I'm going to turn into McDonald's and look there. But then I saw the hotel off to the left there. Yeah, but, um, but uh, those directions were helpful because Connie said about nine and a half miles from the Coleman Bridge. And uh, I, I couldn't find it when I was about nine and a half miles, so I went on a little bit. But yeah, when I came back and got to the McDonald's, it was right around nine and a half miles, Gandhi. So, so thank you. But any, any comment or question? Yes, Becky. I praise the Lord that you blessed us with your time. Well, I'm just so glad to be here. I'm thankful for your kind words. I'm just so glad you're willing to have me. Thank you, Becky. Um, any questions or comments before we close? 
we'll, we'll jump right in again, Lord willing, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see you. Please forgive, forgive me if I forget. Sometimes I've heard speakers say, there are people that are dear to my heart that blessed me, and yet sometimes if I haven't seen them in a while, I might still forget the name, and you need to have it kind of come back. There are a lot of rough things about forgetting things. But there are three good things. Number one, you meet new people every day. <laughs> Number two, you can hide your own Easter eggs. And I can't remember the third. <laughs> but, uh, but forgive me if I get this wrong. Is it Brother Doyle? OK, good. good. Brother Doyle, would you close us in prayer? Thank you, brother, and wonderful to see each one of you tonight. Hope you'll be able to come back for some more sessions. Thank you.